Welcome to The Rest is Politics Question Time with me, Alistair Campbell. And me, Rory Stewart. And this is really exciting because now we're fully, this is the first question time into the six-week UK election, but a lot of other stuff to cover around the world, I guess. I think we should start with this question from three women. I'm, I'm assuming three women is a social media handle rather than the person's name. Will you still be running your election roadshow in Cardiff on October 14? I saw a poster for it on Cardiff Station yesterday. Is the tour still going ahead? Yes, it is. Um, Rishi Sunak has complicated things for sure, but all of the venues that we've booked are going ahead. I think we'll have to sort of make it more international, Rory. It'll be the post-election UK roadshow, but there'll still be the American election and lots of other elections going on. So yes, they're going ahead. Tickets are going very, very well in lots of different places. We've still got a few thousand to shift in the O2, but we're getting there. It'll be exciting because, uh, at least as far as Rory's concerned, um, you're going to have the chance to discuss the first Labour government for 13 years in office and what it's done in its first few weeks. And we get into some gritty policy issues. Where's the country going as well as the international stuff? I've got to say, Rory, you, yeah. you, you, wait a minute. You've got Rishi Sunak, who says that we've all got to learn maths to 18. You're stuck on this 13 years thing. We're into the 40, it's 14 years now. 14 years. Labour was 13 years, 13. 14 years. It's 14. 2010 to 2024. Unbelievable. Well, I mean, it's really astonishing, isn't it? really astonishing that they've mentioned. I yeah. think it's, and that's another reason why I don't think they can win. I think I'm right in saying no government in modern British history has ever done more than 14 years. And and this, this means that, you know, we're comparing it to, well, it's one of the reasons that things look a bit odd. I mean, we're comparing it to the 13 years of Tory government that went through to Macmillan and what was achieved yeah. or what wasn't achieved, which I think Labour referred to as 13 wasted years. <laughs> Then there was the pretty long period of, of um, Margaret Thatcher and John Major. But even that, oddly, you've got a sense that a great deal was happening during that period, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. That from 79 through to 97, so I guess that is a longer period, but that you really got a sense. It was 18 that years, yeah. You got a real sense that, that the Conservatives changed the country. Whereas in this case, I guess we're going into an election where I'm going to appeal to our wonderful polling from JL Partners again, where I suspect we'll find, as we do these polls every week, many people in the public struggle to work out what actually has changed the last 13 years, which wouldn't be true of the earlier periods. No, that's right. 14 years, Rory, 14 years. 14 years. Uh, now, Rory, let me ask you this one, because I know yep. this is something that you, you're you interested in, and so am I. Rebecca Walker, can the UK's creative industry still be considered a soft power? Oh, now, this is, this is yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the stats on... UK creative industries, and in particular on film production, are completely staggering. So 17.4 billion pounds, that's 17.4 thousand million pounds brought into the economy, nearly 290,000 people employed in the UK. Um, and individual films, Barbie, for example, which both of us watch, which was shot in Hertfordshire, brought in about 80 million pounds to the British economy. <laughs> Sorry, which both of us watched. Can you say, can you make sure that, that was both of us watched? I.e. we went to see it and we watched it. We don't, it sounds to me like we watch it, like we watch it all the time. <laughs> I only watched I, it once. I, and, I'm only, I, and, and I'm only ever going to watch it once. I'm blaming the fact my tooth has come out. I've been attacked by my son about this. He says I sound funny now. I've lost my enunciation. Um, uh, the, the other people who've done i mean star wars huge number of star wars films shot in the uk uh 13 billion pounds of disney sales over the last six years much of it generated from the uk tom cruise his mission impossible movies he loves the uk as a location um but what we need in the uk and we're now moving into second place behind hollywood worldwide for films is we still need production space because there's been real moments of where independent production companies haven't been able to go on the ground. And this relates to some of the conversations we've had, because there's a planning application in Amalo at the moment, which I think is on the edge of the green belt, which could be fantastic for the creative industries, but raises a lot of the issues that you and I debate a lot about whether you're prepared to compromise on the green belt for these kind of growth opportunities. Yeah, well, that's what, that's why I suspect uh, Labour keep talking about the grey belt. And that event we did, you and I did in Leeds last week with uh, UK Reef, with, with all the investment and infrastructure and housing people, I think they were looking to be able to sort of expand the places that they could uh, 
do that kind of thing. Now, Rory, just on the same subject, yeah. um, and I wasn't going to raise this, but given that I, I, I plugged my, my books on the main podcast, but then discovered that due to ridiculous Ofcom rules, that wasn't allowed to go out on Channel 4, I am going to say that one of the people who's quoted in my book on this very subject is none other than Kira Knightley, who, as you probably remember from the Albert Hall, is a, a big fan of the podcast. But she makes the point that our country is globally renowned for culture and for creativity and the creative industries. But she says she sometimes feels that politics views culture as a luxury rather than the necessity for education of the economy that it is. And I think um, that I, I completely endorse that. I think that Labour, if they come into power, should put the creative industries right at the heart of this growth strategy. And I hope we hear something of that during the campaign. Yeah, it'd be great to see who the new culture secretary is going to be coming in. And we are Anthony Gorman, the interview on leading, if people haven't heard it, is a really powerful case made for why Keir Starmer and Labour really need to get behind the creative industries. He paid tribute, actually, to the Conservative culture minister, Grey Gowry, who he said was the last decent Tory culture minister. In the House of Lords. House of Lords. Um, he, he, he also said, if you remember, because if, if um, the shadow cabinet becomes the cabinet, Sangam Debonair... Uh, will, would be the culture secretary, and she is a she is like a really serious musician. Now that doesn't necessarily translate, obviously, uh, automatically translate, but I think it does help if you have people in those sorts of positions who, in their own lives, have lived and understand why this stuff is not just you know arty farty stuff for people who like the arts, but actually is fundamental to who and what we are as a country and the economy, we, the kind of economy that we can build. I also think, again, we could be learning a bit from France. France has just given a palm door to George Lucas, despite the fact that Lucas has made so many of his Star Wars movies in Britain, helped British economy a lot. I'd like to see Labour looking at giving an honorary knighthood to him in the way that we did to Sir Ridley Scott. Um, it would be a pity if the French yet again charmed one of the great factors of our economy away with their, their offers of honours. Oh, God, Rory, you and your honours list, honestly. Panama, Anthony Shaw. Please do, I think do means here, discuss, the Panama election, really high turnout, surge of independence, big two parties wiped out. Leading candidate disqualified, disqualified by court for dodgy dealings. He fled to the Nicaraguan embassy and his vice presidential nomination wins the election in his place. Bizarre election thoughts. And Anthony, thank you for your perseverance because you've been asking that for... For some time. Uh, so Rory, just cover off yeah. the Panama election. He's right, it was interesting. Panama election. So the, the, the key key finger in the Panama election is a man called Ricardo Martinelli, uh, commonly known in Panama as El Loco. <laughs> so, El Loco was the uh, president from 2009 to 2014. Very colourful figure, credited with enormous investment and growth, uh, increasing the size of the Panama Canal. He was done for wiretapping, done for money laundering, was running again in the election. So having been there 2009, 2014, hoping to come in as the 2024 candidate, um, but unfortunately uh, was sentenced to 10 years in jail, uh, took refuge in the Nicaraguan embassy in Panama City from when he, whence he was running his campaign until the electoral commission ruled against him. So his vice president, Jose Raul Molino, who also was in jail for embezzlement in 2015, um, managed to come in with a 10-point lead, backed by Martinelli, backed by El Loco, and defeated uh, Ricardo Lombana, who's a diplomat. Um, and Panama, I think, interesting. I mean, it's an interesting example of an economy where they have some of the things that we grumble about in Britain without apparently the economic effects. So you know, mm. like Britain, people complain about skill shortages, a lot of migrant labor coming in, unskilled migrant labor, uh, not properly funded pension system. But all that seems to mean in Panama is that growth has dropped from 7.5% a year down to 2.5% a year, which we'd be biting people's hands off for. They, they had a genuine boom, didn't they? And it sort of, it sort of tailed off. But it's uh, that the, the, we, we should have probably discussed this at the time, because it is one of the more interesting elections that's happened recently, relatively small country, I think it's about four and a half million people, uh, or four, perhaps four, four and a half million voters. But uh, uh, the right wing lawyer, Mr. Molino, is now the El Presidente. Just on El Loco, Rory, yeah. I'm sure you know who the most famous El Loco is. You must know who the most famous El Loco is. Is he a boxer, a wrestler? No. No? 
Go on, who is he? <laughs> El, the original, as far as I were concerned, the most famous El Loco was a Colombian goalkeeper by the name of Jose René Higuita. Oh. Um, and if people want to see some absolutely amazing coverage of a goalkeeper who was just a bit... I mean, most goalkeepers are said to be crazy, but um, uh, he really was... He, he, he and what fully, made him crazy? He was just very brave. His, He'd... Uh, He'd he'd fling himself under people's boots. No, he did kind of really crazy, weird things on the pitch. And uh, uh, he he, he had some sort of extraordinary techniques that he used that nobody else used. And and just was a bit, you know, like a lot of these Latin American footballers, like my friend Diego Maradona that I never talk about. (laughs) Just a very, 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 very live wire wire character. What I've never understood is you played with Pele and Maradona. Why is it we don't hear more about Pele? Very good question. Partly because the Maradona day, I, the, I can I can feel the editors rolling their eyebrows even as I say this, Rory, because as you know, I talk about it all the time. The Maradona was special because it was the first amazing playing football experience of my life. And I played alongside him for 45 minutes. Pele was a match at Stoke City's ground where he was unveiling a statue of Gordon Banks uh, of the famous save that Gordon Banks, the England goalkeeper, made from Pele. And he was sort of, he was a bit older. Uh, he was effectively just coaching rather than playing. And it just wasn't as exciting, the Maradona uh-huh. thing. And I've, I've always just loved Maradona. I mean, even before I met him, I loved him. So that's why I don't talk quite as much about Pele as I, did, as I do about mm. Maradona. Here's a more serious one for you. Jamie, is it time for a new national curriculum? Current one's 10 years old when you consider world events and societal changes since 2014, completely dated. It's also totally unwieldy with too much to teach. To what extent do you think the general election winner will affect the content of a new national curriculum? Yes, is the answer. I think the the, the current curriculum is largely the, the 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 most recent changes were largely under the watch of of Michael Gove now i know that michael gove has his followers and has his fans as education secretary but i think i always felt that michael gove's vision of education was rooted very strongly in his own education and i actually think there's so many so, so many issues and so many things that children today should be learning about they weren't even around then you know artificial intelligence I think that some of the societal changes should be part of our discussion. And I think the debate about history has changed. We had quite a few questions this week about what somebody called the weaponization of history. I do think there has to be a bit of a change in the way we we, we learn and teach history. Um, And I think, you know, we've talked before about how if there is a Labour government, in the early days, they're going to have to do things that aren't just about money and aren't just about sort of rebuilding infrastructure and so forth. And I think the curriculum is an interesting place to start where you can signal changes. Um, The downside, I guess, for teachers is that it's always very, very disruptive when you have big changes to the curriculum. But I think think now, at this this period in history, is a good time to do it. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we spend a lot of time on the podcast complaining about everything changing too much, that there have been, you know, whatever, six housing strategies, five employment strategies, 11 ministers or 14 ministers in this, that, and the department. Mm. So actually the curriculum is rather unusual, being something that has actually stayed the same for 10 years. And I guess teachers who are very, very angry about a lot of things, particularly the volume of paperwork, the way offset and sections work, the way school funding has been affected, presumably feel some relief that at least there's not they're not having to learn and teach a completely different curriculum every two, three years, but maybe 10 years is long enough for a refresh. Yeah, exactly. On the, uh, here's the question from Jack Evans, which follows up. What do you make of how history is often weaponized in politics, the empire being an obvious case? Should there be a shift in our school's history curriculum? Thanks. I've just been reading this wonderful book by Satnam Sanghera called Empire World, mm-hmm. which is really, I thought, thoughtful and balanced. One of the things that he rejects is the sort of um, totting up the plus and minuses of empire. He points out there's something very odd about saying, well, you know, on the one hand, you know, we massacred people in Amritsar and empowered the slave trade. On the other hand, we built railway lines and opened universities. What he tries to do is give a sort of much richer, fuller picture of its different dimensions. He, He actually quotes Kwasi Kwarteng, who um, we interviewed on leading quite a lot in the book. Um, 
I, I, I thought it was a, a really thoughtful grown-up way of doing it that finished actually with quite a moving section of him attending the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. You mentioned quasi, the quasi Quarteng interview, and, and obviously that got a lot of, well, it got a lot of listeners, but it got a lot of comments from people who were saying, you know, why are you giving a platform to this guy who smashed the economy with Liz Truss, etc. But I've, I, one of the things I found really interesting in that interview was his take on empire. And I have read his book. It was some years ago now, but I have read quasi Quarteng's book on empire. And I think that is a a very, very good example of where a modern curriculum would take a different look and would have a different uh, a different sense of what the empire was all about. And you see, I, and this is what I meant about with Michael Gove and his take on the curriculum being very much about his view of history and his view of education. Um, so I, 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 that, that was, uh, I, I said earlier, that's obviously where I, where I, I saw this, is in the question about when he talked about weaponized. I think it is weaponized and I think we have to, if we can de-weaponize it, and that means having a more a more measured view of some of these historical events. Now, what about this one, Rory? I don't know whether you followed any of this. Toby Morris on the COVID inquiry. It's been massively overshadowed by other events, i.e., the election. But what did you make of Simon Case's bizarre performance at the COVID inquiry? It was bizarre. Did you see any of it? Well, the, the first the first thing I, I caught a little bit of it, and I'd love to hear more. But I think just as background for listeners that. At the background of it is these WhatsApp messages that we've talked about. So Simon Case, head of the Permanent Civil Service, and you know this is Burke Trend, this is Robert Armstrong, this is Richard Wilson, these kind of grand sort of uh, more than Sir Humphrey figures of the past who are seen as these very sort of dignified, cunning, but, but quite sort of understated figures without, who very careful not to express political views. And Case's WhatsApps were put out, and they were absolutely astonishing. You know, he referred to the Prime Minister as somebody, Boris Johnson, admittedly, but his Prime Minister, his boss, he's sending WhatsApp saying this guy can't lead, he changes strategic direction every day, he surrounds himself with people who are basically feral, he calls him a distrusted figure, he says, he, he says, I've never seen a bunch of people less well-equipped to run a country. Um, so that was, that was, and called officials pygmies. Um, at the height of the pandemic, I mean, so that was that's the background. What? But how about his appearance? It got very little coverage in terms of the sort of big news bulletins because of the election dominating things. But I don't even know whether it was live. The bits I saw, I mean, Toby used the word bizarre. It was bizarre because, as you say, we'd had all that. We knew all those things that he'd said, as it were, privately. The bits that I saw, he was essentially trying to make the case that Boris Johnson was was really quite good at certain things. And he kept doing this thing of um, almost like he was on, it, it felt at times like he was on that program of, you know, just a minute where you're just trying to sort of, you, you're trying to just keep talking. And he kept saying, you know, this is a bit off topic. Well, it's not for him to decide what's on or off topic. That's what the inquiry is there for. And, you know, I'm sure we'll get onto this. And it was bizarre. The whole thing was just weird. And a manner that pff, I found Really quite bizarre. Really, I mean, bizarre is the right. Toby, I can't really add to what Toby said. It was bizarre. Um, and it was, it, there was such a disjunction between what we now know went on, what he clearly felt was going on when he was there, and what he was now saying about it. And I wonder whether he just didn't want to make things worse for Boris Johnson. I just don't know. Now, there's one here, Rory, Paul Dreschler, who I'm sure you'll know. He's the ex-president of the CBI. And you'll watch what he does here, Rory. It's very, very clever. You know, it's almost as clever as some of your book plugs. There is something not quite right as I watch all the architects and champions of the most consequential decision taken by the UK this century, Brexit, abandon ship and depart Parliament with smiling faces on pl and platitudes. I am on edge, but mm. what can I do? Mm, he's very clever. I like that. That's really? clever. That's good. We like that. But I he's mean, got he, a point. He's got a bloody point. He has got a point. Well, it's it's really astonishing. Matthew Said wrote an article in The Telegraph where in an article that basically says this isn't a serious election and we're not a serious country. And basically, he takes Brexit as exhibit number one. I mean, he, he has other ones like Cameron cutting defense spending every year as China and Russia was clearly on the rise so that we're now coming up from this very low start. He points out that it, the public needs to take responsibility for the fact that on the one hand, we complain about lack of housing. On the other hand, we black, block every housing application. We 
complain about public services not being funded, but we don't want to pay taxes. But his biggest example, of course, is Brexit. And he says, and I, I agree with you, it is staggering, absolutely staggering that we're going into an election where neither the Conservatives nor Labour nor the Lib Dems are prepared to raise an issue where not just almost half the country voted to remain, but where a majority of people now think leaving the European Union was a mistake and where there are so many things like a customs union, which could at least be a halfway house towards repairing some of the damage. Yeah. I mean, I've, I felt the most disappointing part of the interview on leading with Rachel Rees is when we got onto the European Union and Brexit, because she just wasn't going to go there. She just was not going to uh, allow it to become an issue. And I felt... Um, you know, I talked on the main podcast, I thought Keir Starmer did a pretty good job in his first big speech of the campaign and the way that he dealt with the media and so forth. But you've also got to look to the media. I mean, they all raise the questions, you know, small boats and, uh, you know, tax and trust, trust and all the stuff that you'd expect. But at some point, both Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer have got to be asked about this in a serious way, because I cannot think of any other issue that would have been so, to use Paul Dreschler's word, consequential, and had such a huge impact upon our economy, 4%, and what's more, with this fingerprint thing coming down the track that is going to drive people absolutely crazy. I can absolutely confidently predict that when we're having to stop and get out of cars and get out of lorries and go and get fingerprint tests and all that sort of stuff. So, And yet, it's not part of the... The campaign, which instead can become this, let's talk about national service. Let's talk about a new sort of approach on pensions. So I just think that you, Paul says he's on edge, but what can I do? I think all we can do, Paul, is actually demand of our politicians and demand of our leaders that on this consequential issue, they actually get to a point of saying, yeah, hasn't gone that well. We're not talking about going in the, you're back in the European Union anytime soon but we're going to have to fix it. And that is what Michael Heseltine, uh, he, he did an interview and, 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 and was, he's 91 now, Michael Heseltine, and he said, I've been through a lot of elections. This is inevitably the most dishonest election of our lifetime, of my lifetime, because nobody wants to talk about Brexit. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I, I listened carefully to the Michelle Hussein interview on Today programme with Keir Starmer which maybe we, we should talk about for a second, um, uh, which I, I thought he struggled a bit, actually. He, he found his feet, strangely, a little bit more on Palestine, where he sounded more confident and had clearer principles. But he struggled on university tuition fees, two-child benefits, Diane Abbott, House of Lords. But she didn't push him, and there may be an example of it, she didn't push him significantly on Brexit. Um, instead, she's going for these trying to catch him out on these these other domestic issues. Why, why do you think that is? Why, why do you think that in mm. that big flagship interview, that's what well, the direction she chose not to go? What's interesting about this, this campaign is that I suspect both of the main parties will probably complain that they're not always allowed to be on the agenda that they want to be on. But actually, I think the media lets them play their agenda pretty strongly. So um, Jonathan Reynolds, the shadow business spokesman, he was on the radio this morning with um, Emma Barnett. And it was, again, she wanted to bang on about why, why Keir Starmer had called himself a socialist and whether that meant he was the same as Jeremy Corbyn. And it was just a kind of redundant, rather dull, dancing on a pinhead kind of argument. And Jonathan Reynolds got a bit ratty and pushed it away and what have you. I actually think he's a very good media performer, I must say. But he's the shadow business secretary, okay? Business now, you and I have been doing quite a few events with business. What is the thing they keep saying to us? Can Brexit. somebody please address the problems that Brexit is causing? So if you've got the shadow business secretary, who, if the polls are right, by July the 5th will be the business secretary, business, it seems to me, is very, very, very keen to know what any future government will do to try to repair our trading relations with the European Union. So why talk about some theoretical discussion about the meaning of socialism, the word socialism, as opposed to pinning the business secretary on that? So I'm sure this will annoy both the main parties in equal measure, but I honestly think, to use Paul Dreschler's word, something as consequential as Brexit has to be part of this election debate, whether the main parties want it or not. Good. 
Um, Jacob Cross Mayhew, two years ago, Rory joined the Larry Summers was that, Choir. Was that only good, Rory, not very good? Uh, I, 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 was that only good, not very good? I, I think we'll give it very, very good. <laughs> very, very good. Um, Jacob Cross Mayhew, two years ago, Rory joined the Larry Summers Choir of gloomy economic predictions, which surprised me. Hardly any economists I follow had this view. We seem to have had the soft landing predicted by Krugman two years ago. Will Rory admit he was wrong at that time? So that this is this is good memory, and Rory very happy to admit he's wrong. I think uh, uh, my a track record of predicting the future is not great. I, I would add that the track record of most economists and geopoliticians of predicting the future is not that great, which is why we should be much better about putting forward probabilities instead of certainties. We should all get in the habit of saying, I think there's a 30% chance this happening or a 70% chance this happening. Yeah. Run, this is going to happen. My friend Much- Machaba Rahman, the Eurasia group, who does these very interesting uh, political analysis all around Europe, he, he does exactly that. He, he sort of, so he, I think his prediction of a Labour majority has gone from like 40 to 90 over a short period of time. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and I, I tend to say there's a 100% chance of Labour being elected, but you've got to take that with a pinch of salt because, of course, things can go wrong. Um, the, the Larry Summers, Paul Krugman thing is quite abstruse. Uh, Larry Summers, who is very big deal, uh, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, Harvard professor, was uh, correctly predicted that there would be inflation, which others had been downplaying, and so initially seemed to be vindicated on that. Um, but you're absolutely right that uh, he and um, another man called Dr. Doom at NYU, who I'm a, a great fan of, uh, were on the gloomy side, and I was attracted by the more gloomy side. And actually, the US economy in particular uh, has performed well over the last 12 months, which matters a lot for the global economy. Of course, the mm. European and British economies are pretty disappointing. I mean, the, the figures that Rishi Sunak's going to be going to the campaign on of 0.6% growth, um, as the Conservatives will point out, means that the UK economy is now growing faster than the major European economies, which is just a way of saying the major European economies are in, are not doing well economically at the moment. Mm. Although this 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 stat he keeps using about, you know, we're growing faster than the United States, it relates to one quarter, which any economist will tell you is uh, is not really uh, suitable for that kind of great claim. Here's a nice, short, easy, trivial one, which I can answer very, very quickly. Stephen Clark, does the Prime Minister actually get a set of keys to Downing Street? Oh. The answer, Stephen, is no. Oh. If you look very closely at the famous black door, you will see that there is no lock on it. It is manned 24 hours a day by a human being. And what's more, just inside that door, there is a camera. You, you, you might sometimes wonder why when people are walking up, generally they don't have to stand there and knock the door. Uh, and that's because they're being watched coming up the street and the door opens magically. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I, I guess if you're the Prime Minister and the door doesn't open magically, uh, you, you can't struggle for your keys. Um, uh, Sabine <laughs> Sharnagal, as your faithful listener from Munich, there can be only one question for Alistair. Will company save Bayern Munich? So this for listeners is, this was the, the, the manager of, of Alistair's team, Burnley, which having not, not done that well, it seems, has been rewarded by being made the manager of one of the biggest teams in the world. What's going to happen there? Well, what do you make of it? What do you make of it? <laughs> I know you don't follow <laughs> football, but when you, when you, when you spell well, the as, facts as total, out like that, what total, do you make of it? As a total outsider looking at it, I'm completely astonished because... You were relegated, and really, it wasn't a great season for you. So I don't think he's really proved himself as a manager. So why would one of the biggest teams in the world bring him in as their manager? What's the answer? You're right. We didn't have a great season last year, um, and it is one of the biggest clubs in the world. So he's absolutely landed on his feet, and we now have to try and find a new manager. Well, maybe there's hope for Rishi Sunak yet. I mean, maybe he'll come out of a not great performance and get some huge big job off the back of it. Maybe this is the maybe this is the thing. Well, isn't that what isn't that what Zach Goldsmith is saying has already happened that he's on his uh, way incidentally, to California? That's really this California uh, this California dreaming thing is pretty unpleasant. Yeah, it was um, the problem that Michael Ignatieff faced in when he was running to be leader of the uh, prime minister in Canada, leader of the Liberal Party. People kept running. Oh, was it just these. dropping in? Yeah, that's right. Just visiting were all the posters, and everyone kept saying, 
when he loses, he's going to leave Canada and go back to teaching at Harvard or do something else glamorous. And of course, as yeah. a result, Michael all the way through the campaign had to say, no, even if I lose, you know, I'm I'm hanging around, I'm sticking around. And he did for a couple of years, uh, but then eventually moved on and now lives in Vienna. And I guess um, it's going to be very damaging for Rishi Sunak because people like my mother, I mean, a traditional conservative voter, she's out campaigning for the Scottish Conservatives as we speak, um, is very troubled by the idea that he might be about to put his children in uh, a school in California. And so it is very important that Rishi Sunak leans hard into the fact that this is his country, he's deeply proud of it, and it's not that he's heading off to sunnier climes, because that'll be very damaging for him, won't it? Mm. Well, just to tell your mother, and I'm, I'm shocked and, 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 and disturbed that despite my attempts to get her over to the Labour side of the fence, she's still out there for the Scottish Conservatives. Uh, but in the poll, perhaps we should close with this, the top emotion amongst the British public in the event of a Sunak win is disappointed. Let me close with a fi final one, which I think is becoming ever more relevant. Uh, Lars and Arvid from Sweden. I had a discussion with a friend how the dynamic of the podcast might change in the case of a Labour win, which obviously I think is almost inevitable. Will Alistair become more defensive of the government and Rory more critical Thank you for an excellent podcast. You think you're going to become more defensive of the government by any chance? Uh, well, I, 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 let, what do you think, Rory? I, I think you <laughs> think I will. I think I have to tell you, I have to tell you that Fiona thinks I'm not nearly as hard on Labour as I am on the Tories, but that's because I think the Tories are truly awful. I can't stop <laughs> thinking that. That's what I think. I think I'm they're so truly terrible. On. Well done, Fiona. You know, so. She, well done. She's keeping you honest there. That's good on her. <laughs> yeah, but you, but for example, you, I think in the interview with, with Rachel Reeves, I think you were very, very hard on her. I think harder than you were, say, on Kwasi Kwarteng, who, let's be honest, smashed the economy. So maybe we're both a little, because listen, elections do strange things. Quasi quoting, I didn't even want to interview on the podcast. That was you that pushed it. <laughs> I said, this is going to be awkward. <laughs> um, no, it, it's, an, it's, a, it's a weird dynamic, isn't it? Because I feel I've got an obligation to make the case against Labour, partly because we're supposed to be disagreeing agreeably. Yeah. And it's the Rachel Reeves one that gave me, honestly, speaking to Shoshana, that was the one where I came out and said, actually, I'm quite open to the story around Labour. I want to be convinced. And and the Rachel Reeves one was one that really made me think, whoa, hold a second, this really isn't what I was hoping for. Um, so I, th that was also, I think, a bit... What did Shoshana think? She she thought she did an okay job at some bits, but she slightly agreed with me that that a lot of it was pretty wooden, and and it's just it's a sort of lack of it. It feels like a lack of confidence, lack of imagination. It would be nice to mm. to get her. Maybe when she becomes chancellor, she'll find her feet a bit more and open up a bit more. But it'd be nice to get a little bit more into her thinking. Mm. All, all one's getting is a sense of what she won't do rather than mm. a sense of what she will do. Mm. I, th I think the other, the other thing to, to bear in mind is that, I, and again, I, th I, th I thought this watching Keir Starmer, and I deliberately tried to put myself in the mindset of one of these people who doesn't follow politics. I was deliberately trying to do that. I d decided to do that from the word go. And what I noticed in Keir Starmer was a confidence that wasn't there two years ago. Um, I thought, it, and particularly actually in the way that he dealt with the media. So for example, you mentioned earlier the interview with Michelle Hussein about the Middle East. The question was, if he were prime minister today, what would he say to Benjamin, ben, Benjamin Netanyahu about these attacks on Rafa? And he just said, stop, stop now. Now, I think a few, even a few months ago, I think he would have gone into a rather convoluted sort of, you know, explain the whole picture, etc. Now, I think that comes from confidence of knowing, feeling comfortable in yourself. I think Rachel Reeves is probably still on that on that trajectory. I think what you were getting irritated by was a sense, one, that she was saying things that she said lots of times before, and two, that there was a sort of a, a, a slight defensiveness to all of it. Um, you were predicting what her answers were going to be. She was predicting what your questions were going to be. And it all got a bit scratchy. And I think that comes with, with confidence. I think actually just having the confidence to be in your own space, be in your own skin and, and, and deal with whatever is, 
is thrown at you. But listen, in answer to our questions uh, to our friends from Sweden, I think it will change because politics is going to change. The gov a change of government will lead to all sorts of different issues and different things that we'll talk about. I think I will have very interesting insight. I've just told you something you didn't know about the Downing Street door. I'll have lots of interesting insights about what happens in a transition. I hope I'll, I'd, I'd have lots of interesting insights about how you put together a team inside government about how you prioritize and that sort of thing. So I think it will become different. Um, but listen, just in the last question or two, I was, I, I, I have been and will continue to be very critical about Labour not being open uh, and straightforward about the changes that are going to need to our relations with the European Union. I will keep banging away about that, just as I'll keep banging away about, you know, other things I believe in, one of which we've just secured, which is the lowering the voting age, but I'd now like them to go further and have compulsory voting and proper political education in schools and all the other stuff that I keep going on about. Well, very, 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 very good to that. And uh, <laughs> look forward to talking soon. <laughs> And I'm so glad to hear that Shoshana agrees with you in a way that perhaps Fiona doesn't always agree with me. Oh, well, she doesn't always agree with me. She just did slightly on that one. Um, okay, let's no, talk sure. soon. And thanks again. <laughs> All the best. Bye. Bye-bye.